We do thank you, our God, who is the creator of heaven and earth and all things seen and not seen. And so we just acknowledge today that we come to know mostly about you, but also to honor the work of your servant, to open our eyes and hearts to further understand the depth of understanding. Great theologians, great people who have loved you, who also love this natural world that you've created too. And so for Chris, we would just pray your blessings on the years that he's invested, that the, he would delight in honoring who you are and the, the work that he's been able to do and to bring a voice to uh, the future of how we might think more clearly about what it means to be deeply scientific, but also passionate about the love that you bring to us. So for all these things that you open up to us, we pray your blessing, this name, you who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And welcome everyone. So good to see all of you that are joining us and uh, Today, the, our guest is Chris Kaiser. Chris, thank you for coming. It's just a, wonderful that we get a chance to talk with you today. Um, thank you. I'm going to put in the chat for everyone a link to the webpage for the chapter that we're discussing, which is Chris Kaiser, Humanity in an Intelligible Cosmos, uh, his chapter from the Promise of Trinitarian Theology. Theologians in Dialogue with T.F. Torrance. And the reason that you might be interested in that record is that it has a, um, a PDF of a file that is kind of an outline of the, of the chapter. And we will use that PDF as, but we'll just follow it kind of loosely today. Uh, you can download it from that web page, or I've also uploaded it to chat. So you can get it from the chat as well. And um, I'd like to start with just a little bit about, about background, um, the chapter itself and the response by TF that pairs with this chapter, both begin by noting, Chris, uh, your relationship with TF uh, as a student and colleague. Uh, would you like to summarize your, uh, some of us have talked to you about your background before and we'll have more chances for that, but before we get going, just give us a little summary of your relationship with Tia. Well, yes, um, and uh, that's, I think you mentioned that there's also uh, something posted on your website which goes into all the things that I could remember when my memory was good. <laughs> um, and things I had letters about, but um, I when I was a student at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, I was teaching physics at Gordon College, and I wanted to try to relate science and theology. And I was looking for a, a theologian who was uh, deep, not just a modernist theologian, but one deeply uh, imbued with the historic. Uh, faith and its uh, development, and who also was interested in science. And I couldn't find anyone until I came across a review of uh, uh, Torrance's uh, books, Space, Time, and Incarnation, and Theological Science, which was in a journal called the uh, Evangelical Quarterly, uh, British, intervarsity related, I think. But um, I looked at that and I said, here's the guy I'm looking for. And so I made contact uh, and he said, yes, uh, I'd love to have you as a student at Edinburgh, of course. And uh, we worked that out. Martha and I decided that that was what we were gonna do. And um, so we took we money out of the bank and moved to Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, well, um, I met with Torrance, and he, he recommended that I read Einstein and Polanyi and also a, a student of Niels Bohr. And I got mostly interested in, in the writings of Bohr uh, and wanted to write my dissertation on that. And the first time I had a proposal, presented a thesis proposal, because they do that they, for postgraduate students, you do that right away, a, a, a dissertation proposal. Uh, he said, well, I thought that was a halfway house. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> but I, you know, I tried to explain my interest and, um, and, and he, he said, okay, yeah, if, if you can make that work, I'd love to see it. And 
And uh, I sat in, of course, on all his lectures and also those of John McIntyre. And the two of those, John McIntyre was systematic theology, I think it was called, and uh, Torrance was then called Christ Christian or church dogmatics, must be. Um, and those were eventually merged. So they only had one professor, uh, which is another story. But um, I worked on the dissertation. Uh, I loved Edinburgh because uh, there's new college there with its courses. I studied with Bill Shaw and a number of other people. Um, but there was also the university with its physics department. I was down there a lot and also the social studies the program and others. And I just soaked up everything I could possibly do and put a lot of it in my dissertation. Um, so uh, that was that was really a, a very important experience for me to finally to work out something that uh, this on the principle of complementarity uh, that uh, helped me uh, develop my own voice, so to speak, in theology. But also, I should have mentioned the Church Fathers, which uh, Torrance. Uh, induced me to really uh, in any depth, particularly Hillary and Athanasius, Basel. Um, so I made a lot of use of that in the dissertation. Uh, that's 1971 to 74. And, and um, uh, it went well. Uh, and he had comments occasionally on what I was doing and helped me out, uh, usually with, with some fine details, which were helpful. Um, and then should I just keep going or do you want to stop uh, there? Sure, or, or I'll interject for a moment and then you can keep going. If, if anyone hasn't read the response by TF to this chapter, uh, you're missing out on, on some important points. And the, for the whole first page of it, you can just tell how, how much TF treasured that time with Chris, even at the time, much later when this book was published. For example, on page 332, he says, um, he wrote a brilliant doctoral dissertation. And then to my delight, he stayed in Edinburgh for several years and taught in my department where he assisted me also in my seminar classes in patristic texts. If I remember correctly, they were texts of Athanasius and of Hillary. In Edinburgh, he was a great help to me in my struggles to get to grips with natural science. And it, it goes on uh, quite a bit there, but uh, uh, that's, that's a remarkable testimony of a collegial um, environment where, where he looked at you not just as a, a, a student, but as a colleague as well. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and, and uh, uh, as, you, as you know from the, uh, the paper that you posted there, that uh, he wanted me to stay on there, but uh, the economic crunch uh, made that impossible, which was a big blow to me because I thought this was just perfect. This was just exactly what God made me for. Yeah. And um, well, the Lord basically said, well, no, hold on, wait a minute. Uh, there's other possibilities, I guess, but it took me a little while to adjust to that. So anyway, um, yeah, we were there for uh, till 75 and then finally moved back to the States. And meanwhile, then he had heard from a professor at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan, which I had never heard of, uh, but uh, the pr president there was John Hesselink, uh, who had studied BART and knew Torrance through that. And that was the one of the next lessons that the Lord taught me. It's not what you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so Torrance, uh, 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 Hesselink had been in touch with Torrance saying they were looking for somebody. And this was amazing because at that time with the uh, Arab oil boycott and, and the long gas lines, and, Nobody was hiring. I wrote over 100 letters looking for open positions and I couldn't get it, find, even find an opening to apply for. But it so happened that, that Western Seminary was uh, growing and uh, they needed an extra person to work in both historical and systematic, which from the point of view of a Torrance student is perfect because the way he did theology was very much historical as well as systematic or dogmatic. 
And um, well, it took a little while, a little processing, but if, in the meantime, we, I worked as a computer programmer, uh, which was very interesting to be exposed more to the world of uh, industry and contracts and subcontracts and so forth. Uh, and but then eventually I was asked to uh, candidate and eventually hired at Western Seminary. Martha and I moved out to Holland. Uh, I'm now in Michigan, near there, in a different town. Uh, and we were there uh, in Holland for 40 years. All right. Wow. And had a tremendous ministry and influence uh, through that, that career. For example, on the handout, if anyone um, uh, is missing it, it can be downloaded from the page for this chapter that uh, should be in chat. And it's also uploaded to chat. But it, the handout lists um, uh, some of your books. The first one that I'm aware of is The Doctrine of God, published back in 1982. And then Creation in the History of Science that came out in 1991. At that point, Chris, I was four years into doctoral study in the history of science and stumbled upon that book in the bookstore of Covenant Seminary in St. Louis. Oh. And oh my goodness, I, that was just such a wonderful book to read. Uh, just prior to my general examinations, in fact, and uh, and so my my familiarity with your work uh, began before I had ever heard of Torrance with that book, and later on, in fact, when I taught, um, had a chance to start teaching history of science and uh, myself, um, I had great success using that book alongside God and Nature, but with uh, Numbers and Lindbergh and. Uh, mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, John, John Headley Brooks, Science and Religion. Uh, those three went over really well with students and I think uh, were a superb introduction to science and history of science and religion. So creation in the history of science, fantastic synthesis of scholarship at the time with your own original insights. And the only problem with it was that the publisher, InterVarsity, I think, no, Erdman's, uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, didn't let you include footnotes. So you were able to come out with a revised version complete with the footnotes that were really needed for scholarly work with Creational Theology and the History of Physical Science, published by Brill uh, six years later in 1997. Tremendous book. I uh, should be on any Torrent Scholar's shortlist for introductory works to the history of science and religion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then um, and, uh, an interesting study of scientific methodology and endeavor toward a theology of scientific endeavor, the descent of science came out from Ashgate in 2007. And then there are so many articles. So um, everyone there, uh, Chris has a profile page on the website. If you log into the website and go to the profile page, there's a link to Chris's CV with uh, all the articles. Uh, you'll also be able to see a link to the other resources that are posted on the website by Chris, including uh, what Chris just mentioned. Uh, made, he made reference to a wonderful um, paper that he's written called My Recollections of Thomas F. Torrance. And um, uh, that is, that, we're so grateful to have that as a resource on the website, Chris. Thank you for giving us that. And I might mention that that um, bef before uh, Bob Walker's edition of, of Torrance's um, lectures, um, Incarnation and Atonement, uh, Chris had lent me class notes from that. They're, they're this uh, very long, compact writing, I guess in a UK version of legal paper, yeah. just incredible. But, but Chris, you gave these to me and they, they were like uh, gold, frankincense or myrrh. They, they were just so valuable to me at that uh -huh. time uh -huh. in my studies. So Do you remember where that was? I, e I emailed you about, or no, uh -huh. it, was, it, it, was, it was before email maybe, but I talked to you about creation and the history of science and you said, you were working on the new version where they'd let you use footnotes. <laughs> and so it was around then that you mailed that to me. Mm -hmm. okay. And then we met up, we actually got to shake hands and meet each other face to face 
at the 92 Pascal Center conference organized oh. by Yitza Vandermeer. Ah, oh, right, yeah, so, right. But, and but Torrance we, was there too. Yes, that's yeah, where yeah, I met yeah. Torrance, right. But I knew of him through you. So you were my door. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So oh, thank wow. you, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so, so happy to share that debt that I have to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we, we, we did, just to let everybody know, we're only going to go about another hour at the most. We wanna keep this a little shorter than usual. And, and so I, I do want to get on to the, to the article itself. Um, and I think maybe a point to mention about the article is that the chapter and the article can just be read straight through. It's very readable. But if you go back and mine the end notes, uh, they, they not only document Chris's own sources for the article, but they are a source in themselves for Torrance's sources and Torrance's thinking. Uh, so much of that personal interaction with, between Chris and Torrance is documented there. And uh, just th th that helps to make this an especially rich and important chapter. All right, so um, maybe we can just walk through section by section. Uh, it, they're titled- Gary, I also want to mention, I do have the article posted on the Facebook site. The chapter is copied there. And I've every day I've been having people read. And today I had them just reading the footnotes. Oh, all right. That's great to leave to treat them in and of themselves. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Super. Okay. So um, let's start with a twofold tribute, starting on two thirty nine, and twofold because it's a tribute to both Einstein and Torrance. And uh, for Einstein, uh, Chris, you you mentioned that your imagination was captivated. And oh my goodness, um, you, one of the, the sources that you cite there is the classic work, The Evolution of Physics by Einstein and Enfeld. And that book, I think, has made a lot of people turn into physicists. Mm -hmm. It's just this absolute, if, if, if anyone wants to read one book to get captivated by the by the history of relativity, but also 19th and early 20th century physics, that's the one to start. Yeah. So, um, and, and you recounted your, your respect for Torrance because he, you saw that he took figure, Einstein himself and other, other scientific figures seriously. And uh, uh, would you like to make any comments, Chris, on this first section, a twofold tribute? I think you got it. Um, it also talks about my personal relationship, but I've already talked about that. Um, the one thing on that section is on page 240. Uh, the, the, I guess it's the second full paragraph, just to say that um, since I finished studying with Tom, I say over the 25 years, well now 45, since I completed my studies, I've come to value more aspects of this thought than I could absorb as a student. And um, uh, that's, uh, that's a whole subject in itself. So I learned a lot from him, but of course I had my own agenda thing, I'd get things put through. And, and uh, in fact, this paper itself is really a kind of a penance, <laughs> like going back and picking up on some of the things that uh, I was not paying enough attention to when I was a student. And there are a lot of other things that could go in that category as well. So that's uh, well, that that certainly helps helps um, is, is relevant maybe to why Torrance expressed such delight with this chapter. Uh, yes. I, I'd, I'd like to single out for everyone the very first chapter in creational theology and the history of science establishes the biblical heritage, the Judeo-Christian thinking of Jewish thought and the church fathers uh, with respect to theology of creation. It's just a tremendous synthesis. And one of the points you make there, Chris, is a corollary of the inexhaustibility of divine wisdom is the inexhaustibility mm -hmm. of, of 
what is of the natural order for us to discover. Mm -hmm. And um, that's part of the theme of this chapter. Uh, it, that, that's one, one part of the mystery of intelligibility. Not only that it's intelligible, but no matter how little or how much we know, there's still more that we can discover we can discover it in that stepwise disclosure. And I love the way that you actually turn that around and say that's true of Torrance as well. Oh, yeah. Understanding him as well. That uh, uh, you mentioned the, the, the book about the theology of scientific endeavor. Uh, that's though I have the word endeavor there, that it's, um, yeah. in fact, as, as time went on, I became uh, thinking more about, really along the lines of Torrance, but more about what makes science tick and how it works rather than just the particular ideas. Yeah. Uh, that was a big change. And I think that Torrance was an inspiration for me there too. With the emphasis on, on an actual epistemological practice rather than a, theor a, a hypo an idealistic conception of scientific knowledge. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, if we go on to the next section, it's the problem of subject object duality in a technological society. This starts on page 240. And you, you make early on this magnificent declaration that I think ought to bring us up short. Scientists and theologians once did commonly read each other in depth. And that's so far removed from our present circumstance, but it used to be true until relatively recently. You know, it, it, we have completely, we've emerged into a world where that is no longer the case. And it's one of the most startling transformations of the mid 20th century. And, uh, and, and I, I appreciate you, you beginning your discussion of duality with that example, that uh, scientists and theologians move into different universes now. And, and so that setting complicates immensely our task if we want to overcome duality in our, in our thinking. In addition, the technological world that we live in complicates our task mm -hmm. because you point out that we live in an increasingly complicated increasingly constructed world because of uh, it's buffered by technology, our new, a new world of human construction, as you put it. And so those, those factors all combine to help us be blissfully unaware that we're not taking the problem of, of duality seriously. And in contrast, Einstein and Torrance were both champions of non-duality. Uh, Einstein, both in science with the theory of relativity and in epistemology with his reflections on method. So there's just and, a... And you, you could say, and I, I think Torrance tries to point that he was religious in his own way. Uh, there are issues there, but... Uh, um, yeah. But the, 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 the reading of the scientists is important, not in this, I get this also from Torrance, uh, not just because we need to know about science, but because they have very interesting insights. And uh, I, I eventually came to see what I was doing is trying to rewrite the history of theology to include the scientists, um, as you say, back uh, and up to the 19th century, uh, that was all one uh, conversation anyway. But even since then, uh, and of course, Torrance uh, refers to Maxwell, uh, Einstein, I think he refers to uh, Archibald Wheeler, uh, Prigogine. Uh, and then I, and I found it also very helpful to bring in Stephen Hawking and Paul Davies and uh, even uh, Wilson, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, e. O. Uh, e. O. Wilson. just died. What's his, Ed, is it Edward Wilson? Ed, Edward Wilson, yes. Edward Wilson, yeah. Uh, even though it, 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 we can't allow the fact that they don't accept a Christian or a biblical view of God interfere with 
the fact that they, they are asking and sometimes coming up with insights and some very deep theological issues. And that's, that's another reason. So they, their voices need to be heard. Absolutely. So when you were casting around for some place to study, uh, for graduate study in theology, you already had a degree in astrophysics. Okay. And you needed to, you were searching for someone that would represent the practice of this conversation between science and theology. And thankfully you found that, but where would someone find that today? Especially now that, um, that mm. Professor Kaiser no longer teaches at <laughs> Western Seminary. Yes. Uh, well, actually there are quite a few uh, programs in science and theology in California. Uh, and uh, of course, since uh, Edinburgh has a program now, I, I'm not perhaps the best per person because I'm not researching that to know uh, the, the qualifications of all these people, uh, but uh, there are a lot of options out there and yeah. maybe other people in the group would have uh, suggestions along that line if they've been. Yeah, I, I meant that more rhetorically as a sigh. Mm -hmm. And, ah, okay. uh, while, while we can find some bright stars, there's not a firmament of many constellations. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just toss out that the, the uh, intellectual and cultural under, uh, investigation of the relations of science and religion is a strength of the department where I teach as well okay. in history Oklahoma. of science at the University okay. of Oklahoma. So uh -huh. if anyone's watching this, please um, feel free to talk to me and come study here. <laughs> okay. Would that be studying with you, Carrie? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I, yeah. So, I, oh, great, great. Well, it's a good, good time to, 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 say, to say that. And, and I'll <laughs> tell you, reading some of your books will be on the things I'll expect them to have read, either before they show up or once before generals. Okay, let's go. I think that's important. Um, and I know students who are interested in graduate work, they say, well, I want to apply to this school and that school, and this is a prestigious and so forth. And I say, you know, it's more important to find the professor or two oh. that you want to study with and do some research into what they're working on. It's something, they're working on something that relates and then communicate with an individual. Oh my goodness, yes. So there would be plenty of reasons to go to New College, but the chief one was the, the mentoring relationship that you had there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah definitely. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we go on to um, the section General Relativity in Einstein's Epistemology, starting on page 242. Mm -hmm. And if I can just uh, launch us into that one, the, uh, you start off by bringing up, I, I think it's a, I mean, I, I just absolutely love the first paragraph there on the problem of interdisciplinarity. We can so quickly think that interdisciplinary conversation is simple, but but to have a, a transfer of ideas that doesn't trample on on the discipline either either side of that that transfer is actually um, a, quite a sophisticated un, uh, un endeavor. Um, in a footnote here, you, you, you actually use the word exaptation, which has come into increasing usage in the last 20 years because of its um, place in evolutionary biology, where a development in one area, for example, the development of feathers for thermal regulation, turns out to be incredibly useful for something that was uh, not anticipated when it originated such as flight. And so um, there are even annual conferences now on exaptation, the study of the transfer of ideas from one domain to another that turn out to be pre-adapted to help solve problems in that other domain on its own terms. Mm -hmm. and, and you're describing that particular uh, issue. Mm -hmm. and, and in physics, epistemology, and theology, that kind of exaptation or transfer of ideas is, um, it is really necessary, but it's so easy to get wrong. And, and um, you point out on page 244 that Torrance did not attempt to relate general relativity directly to the doctrine of God or other areas of theology, mm -hmm. 
the relation has to be almost on a different level than just a mere encyclopedic transfer of content. It, it's a more, more profound interrelation that Torrance envisioned. And uh, uh, so, so that problem of interdisciplinarity is, is one that I think you brought up really well in this section. Um, maybe the, the main point of the section is that while general relativity is an achievement in the content of science, it was also one that had implications for methodology as well. Contrary to all those conceptions of scientific methodology that posit a dualism between theory on the one side and empirical data on the other. Uh, and what Einstein's achievement shows is that there's actually a, a con an integration and a contingent um, uh, contingent order, <laughs> contingent <laughs> order between them. Yeah, a contingent relationship between them, and that that involves two phrases on this page, two forty three, disciplined intuition, or Einstein's phrase, free invention. Uh, and you mentioned Copernicus as well, who, in his whole book, there there are less than two dozen of obser new observations. For example, it wasn't mm -hmm. proposed on the basis the the Copernicus's system was not proposed on the basis of observation. It was, it, it was like general relativity, disciplined intuition, uh, free invention, if you will. Yeah. So uh, did I hit the main point on the head with that or what you else? Just, you just referred to the very uh, uh, sec paragraph on the top of 243 that I had uh, uh, circled, yes. Yeah, of course, you're, you're just developing this as a cumulative argument. The sections are not unrelated. They're each one, one step in a single long argument throughout the chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I appreciate the caution that you make in this section about uh, lest we think that, that reasoning from one domain to another is as simple as just using the same language or transferring um, from the standpoint of one discipline imposing its ideas on another. There's a real deep uh, correlation between the disciplines that must take place. But, it, but for Torrance, it, it's doing that because he could see that Einstein was, was doing that as well in seeing the deep connections between the, the physics of relativity and the, um, the, 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 the implications for rejecting positivist and mechanistic conceptions of method. Okay, the, the next section, Torrance on the mystery of intelligibility. And you, you mentioned the justly famous article by Eugene Wigner, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in Natural Sciences uh, on page 245. Uh, uh, a uh, article Torrance also cites. And uh, you mentioned the 1970 Harris lectures of Torrance, which were published as reality in scientific th theology uh, somewhat later. Torrance there and elsewhere described Einstein's religious awe at the vast comprehensibility of the universe or the astonishing affinity between the order of the universe and the order of the human mind. Mm -hmm. Or here on this page, um, on page 246, two harmonies. One is the harmony mm -hmm. of the order in the cosmos itself, and the other is the harmony between the cosmos and the human mind that can, that can grasp that order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this is just really, mm -hmm. really profound. And, and uh, that actually uh, is also it, it mentioned the book on creation and the history of science. That's uh, where I break down the what I call the historic creationist tradition under four general ideas I try to trace. But the very first one is that one of the comprehensibility of the world, which which then I later realized really has these two aspects to it. Yeah, and that's what really fast. Uh, that's really I think the the, the meat of this uh, paper is trying to unpack that. 
it's one of, I think, the main uh, blind spots, really, in uh, current philosophy. And, and uh, the scientists, many scientists are aware of it, particularly physicists. Uh, Paul Davies is very keenly aware of it, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we're relying on doing things which we don't really have an adequate explanation as to why we're able to do them, particularly mm -hmm. in terms of evolutionary theory. And that's really what this is what I'm getting at here. Oh, by the way, there's a, 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 a misprint on 246, uh, just so I can get this. There are several, but this is the one that really needs to be corrected. The first full paragraph, uh, there's a quote, there could be no science without belief in the inner harmony of the world. Yes. Or without the belief that it is possible to grasp reality with our theoretical constructions. That's, it says without, it, 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 which doesn't make sense. Uh, it's with our theoretical constructions. Oh, very good. In this version, it's been corrected. Oh, well, I think I can do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, then this, I must have a preprint then. So somebody okay. somebody listened to you and and, snuck, and got that corrected for most of okay, us. Okay, great. I'm glad that, that then I can sleep tonight. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And, um, so th th I think the, 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 the real main problem of, of the uh, paper that, it, that, that I want to discuss is really being set up here. Um, so I say there as this crisp quote, this is the middle, middle of 246, as this crisp quote, uh, that's from Torrance's Christian Theology and Scientific Culture, as you mentioned, um, two harmonies are presupposed in all scientific work. I think you just read that, in fact. In fact. Um, and there is a second harmony between that cosmos with its mathematical structure and the feeble efforts of the human mind to grasp the deep structure of, the math, of, their, of its own mathematical tools. Yes. So for purposes of later discussion, uh, I translate this conclusion into the language of biology, which you had already mentioned, Carrie, I'm so glad you did. Uh, exaptation. Um, the human mind is not just adapted to the physical environment in which it evolved, which of course most uh, anthropology focuses on, uh, but it's pre-adapted to the larger cosmos. Uh, that is, the human intellect is adapted to numerous arenas of nature of which it has had no prior direct experience. Relativity theory and quantum theory being, of course, the two prime examples of that, uh, although there are, are others. And this reminds me, um, any of you who ever sat in a classroom with Tom Torrance, I've seen him go to the, well, we used blackboards in those days with chalk, and draw a, 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 a circle concave upwards, uh, convex upwards, and then another one convex downwards, and they represent, the upper one represents the intelligible world and the lower one represents uh, the sensible world. And that these are not connected in any particular way. Of course, Plato had a particular way of doing it, thinking that you remember, you come from the world of ideas and you remember them, but there's no direct connection between them. And um, Torrance usually ended up saying that the incarnation is the overlap. He actually then redrew it with an overlap with uh, the incarnation and the, uh, the intersection of those circles. And I don't know if everyone can follow the picture I have in mind. If you were in this classroom, you've seen it. Um, but I think he's also indicating here that there's a, a prior connection in some way that made the human intellect uh, have this capacity. There has to be some connection there which allows the human intellect to um, uh, have some kind of resonance, or as I pick, use the phrase later, the, uh, pre established harmony uh, with the physical world. And that's a fact, but then the question is exactly why and how is that the case when you lived in a world of play? As I say, you, you, uh, you had a solution. And uh, in Christian theology, Christ, uh, uh, humans are created in the image of God. And that was taken by people in the Renaissance, particularly like Lefebvre de Top, saying that uh, uh, God created the world with a certain pattern. And we, because we are created in the image of God, 
uh, are able to create models that mimic the world God has created precisely because we are in the image of the God who created them. Um, Johann Kepler also made a huge point of that when he was questioned why he ever thought anyone could figure out the, the shape of the uh, uh, planetary orbits. Uh, I mean, does God really want us to do that? And he says, well, we're created in the image of God. So there's an answer there. But for us today, uh, we don't live uh, in a world where that's self-evident. Um, and whereas we, we work in a, with the, the tools of anthropology and evolution, and then eventually that's the question I think needs to be addressed. And I think I kind of jumped ahead to the conclusion of the paper, but I, I think it's, it's all really right here on this page. Yes, I think so. In fact, um, the part that you read, that second to the last paragraph of this section, uh, footnote 34, actually you, in the footnote is where you use the word acceptation. That has sense. Ah, that's the much, one you were referring to. Yeah, okay. much more common. So you're, uh -huh. you're right. You're anticipating the entire rest of the the argument here on this page. I, I, I'm setting it up. Yeah, I'm yeah. setting it up. And yeah. uh, I remember that the editor uh, was a little wondering how Torrance would respond to that, Elmer Collier. And uh -huh. uh, fortunately, I, I did check it out with him. And fortunately, he uh, he gave me his blessing. Um, which I appreciate because I remember him saying in regard to his interpretation of Karl Barth and trying to refurbish a version of natural theology, which is actually related to this topic. He always claimed that uh, Barth gave him his blessing to, to go beyond what he had done in that regard. So Yes. And, that's you know, for, for scholarship on, for torrent studies, um, this, is, this is an exemplary chapter for what scholarship can look like where we try to recover what Torrance thought and taught and wrote, but we also do that in a, a, we show real appreciation when it's critical and we're willing to extend it and go on from there. Uh, he would be the last person who would want us to stop with what he wrote. Yes. Yes. He, he, he gave us tremendous gifts and insights, but it's to enable us to, to continue to articulate and see further. Um, yeah, the, ju just tremendous. Um, you know, the, the next section, comparison with Einstein's views on intelligibility is very short, but you're, you're, you're doing something of what you just did in that last comment of showing how there are many predecessors. Um, Leibniz's phrase, pre-established mm -hmm. harmony mm -hmm. between the mind and nature. Kant's, you, you quote his phrase, the eternal mystery of the world is its own comprehensibility. Einstein, quote, the fact that it is comprehensible is a miracle, end quote. Uh, the mystery of the intelligibility of the cosmos is a belief or a faith essential for science. Um, uh, we could pull in in Torrance's response uh, on page 333. He says, he cites Clark Maxwell as someone who helped drive this home for him. Yes. personally, and said he had steeped his thought in the work of Clark Maxwell and his belief in a divinely established harmony between the world God has created and the human mind. And you mentioned Kepler and, and other many other predecessors that are discussed in creational theology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that by the end of this next section on page 248, um, you can say, in short, what looks like a simple presupposition in modern science mm -hmm. turns out to be a theological truth with deep roots in, if not unique to, the biblical tradition. And uh, and so this- Can I just, this, uh, just continue that, uh, Kerry? Then yeah. Einstein was still close enough to his Jewish roots yes. to realize this. And then Torrance uh, was conversant because, um, uh, Torrance, I, it, it struck me when I was a student, the number of times he would point out that Torrance had Jewish uh, ancestry and Niels Bohr actually was half Jewish. Um, and you've seen the uh, movie Copenhagen where the dialogue between him and Heisenberg is very keenly aware yeah. of that because yeah. um, he was fearful of his own safety, uh, Bohr. But th the point I'm trying to get to is that um, 
I think that's one of the things that he said and stuck in my mind, but I didn't completely appreciate it until until years later. Uh, another one one of the things, so, uh, and I become very interested in uh, more recently in studying the history of Judaism as I think it's as important to Christian theology as the history of science. Um, and um, I so I appreciate that his uh, earmarking that idea. Yes, and you know, it's important to the history of science as well. Um, we happen to have, for example, a yes. Yiddish edition of Einstein's theory of relativity. It was translated into Yiddish in the 1920s. Uh -huh. you know, isn't that incredible? Um, well, for in, isn't it incredible to have, be talking to someone who knows that? <laughs> in, in, in Weimar, Germany, theoretical physics was looked upon as an unrespectable occupation because it was a Jewish preoccupation. But there was something about, uh, of course, being Jewish excluded physicists from the large laboratories and experimental physics was where the action was, so everyone thought. But, but the Jewish physicists had this intuition that no theoretical physics was going to be something where work undreamed of by those large laboratories was really necessary and needed to take place. And, and uh, so Einstein is representative of a whole cultural sensitivity to problem areas in physics mm -hmm. that was, that distinguished Jewish practitioners in that Weimar culture from their contemporaries. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a well-known paradox. Sounds like you might have written something on that, or that's in your lecture, one of your lecture. Classes. Oh, that, that's in our survey courses. That This is just okay. widely, widely known to historians, yeah. yeah okay, good. Yeah, so, uh, and... I, I, I think I may sign up myself. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, it's got, you got me uh, wanting to come. <laughs> um, well, gosh, we yes, there's so much to talk about, isn't there? Perry yeah. has a wonderful website that gives a lot of his history of science and theology. Carrie's Loft, I think it's called, right, Carrie? Oh yeah, I I I've got more. I do more talking than anyone wants to listen to. Just to say, there's readily accessible, wonderful things that are available that you've done. So, well, so thank if you, I Google Carrie. if I Google that, I would find it. Carrie's Loft dot com. Oh, dot com. Okay. No apostrophe. K e r r y s l o f t dot mm -hmm. com. Mm -hmm. One of the tabs across the top is called History of Science Resources. It's a personal blog, it's not a professional blog, but on that tab I do list, and because of the pandemic, I wanted uh, students to be, uh, even ones I don't know, to be able to easily to find online resources that I've produced. So there, many of them are listed in that tab. Thank you. Yeah, and Bill has um, inserted a comment. Um, um, Bill, would you like to unmute and 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 voice this for us? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, my my thought would actually go to something of Torrance's, but uh, uh, his space time and incarnation, uh, it, it, uh, because of the physics background. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh. And and the sequel to that, which I think is his most readable uh, book and gets more in depth into Christian theology, is Space Time and Resurrection. I have that one. Yeah. You. So but, you would uh, recommend Space Time and Resurrection, or 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 the know, other? Look at that, or Space Time and Incar in Space Time and Incarnation as a benefit of being short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and there were lectures, uh, so that's possibly. But I think what you need to do, Bill, is look at them yourself. And, and if you, you have some connection with this uh, professor, you might be able to sense what's the best thing. Uh, maybe some combination of that with the Gospel of Luke. Boy, yes. I, think, I think those are great suggestions. And again, uh, as Chris said, space, time, and incarnation is short and deals with space, time. Um, Space, time, and resurrection is more readable, but also we're entering into the Lent and Easter seasons, and and it it might be quite timely. Uh, I believe you can. Space, time, and resurrection can be one of the best entrees into Torrance's thinking about uh, about a theology of creation. Uh, 
it, it's just tremendous. Yep. Well, thank and, you. and there's a recent we'll, edition. The next book we'll read in the group together with our first Thursday of the month, we'll be going through a space time and resurrection. There you go. Wonderful. Encourage him to join, join up for that. And I, I would look forward to meeting him myself. Oh, he's a very interesting fellow. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll go on then to Torrance on Scientific Discovery, the, the next section that begins on 248. And, um, you know, you're also building in this, in this uh, chapter, Chris, um, you're discerning ways in which Torrance, we, we know Torrance always reads charitably and rehabilitates people that he's talking about so that, so that uh, um, uh, he, he doesn't claim all of the insights that are his own, but you're, you're helping us discern some, some ways in which Torrance either his emph emphasis changes or he's actually adding something going further than what Einstein did. And I think that's a really helpful part of your, your argument. So, so here <coughs> you're pointing out that, that Torrance goes beyond Einstein by emphasizing not just the, the free invention of theory by the mind attuned to the natural order, which has a, which is really giving nature a relatively passive role, but Torrance gives nature a more active role and emphasizes um, the way the natural order impresses itself upon the mind. So for example, on page 249, you quote Torrance saying, uh, because there is no logical road to these laws, the scientist in formulating them must rely on his intuition and that's the free play of the mind. But then he goes on to say, that is upon the sheer weight or impress of external reality upon his apprehension. And that latter part is the emphasis on, on um, the agency of the natural world, almost as if the natural world, the natural order uh, created by God has this revelatory power to disclose itself uh, 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 upon to us. So, so um, uh, would you like to yes, elaborate? That, that, well, just as, I, I, I think uh, for me, that was maybe one of the most difficult. Uh, so, what? <laughs> um, but he, he's onto something. And, and this, this is my continual experience with Torrance. I think, what's this? And then, well, so, um, but then you have like Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yeah. And um, I think we, I just in a group yesterday where we were discussing that. And um, uh, you come, it comes up again in other Psalms like Psalm 148, where all creation is praising God. Um, which is a, a different kind of active role. Um, but the interesting thing that there, and I'm still I'm, here, I'm trying to process it a little differently, maybe than what's in the paper, is that in both of those Psalms, what's held up as an example is the regularity, uh, even the predictability. So the sun goes forth like a strong man to run its race. Well, it's anthropomorphized, but it's a, 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 a known regularity so it's not revealing in it's more like a general relation i guess you would call it in traditional uh, language so i it, um and then the thought occurred to me and I'm, as i say i'm still processing this is that um when we get to know somebody uh based on things they say or asides or or things they do uh, you could say they're revealing themselves to you. Uh, you. Of course, you don't know them entirely, but it's also a question of their allowing you to see something. Um, and I think that's the same, that is the way I could tie in then to the, the, the way I uh, process this in the paper, that the uh, interconnections within the created, or it's probably where you were going anyway, um, 
are something that press back on us. So if we have a particular theory, a, a, a priori idea that uh, is, is inappropriate, you try to put it into practice, uh, or even in terms of what you already know, uh, it, it, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, it will not, the created order will not allow you to do that. So I, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm done ju doing justice to it or not, but it seems to me it's something like an interpersonal relationship of allowing someone to know some things. And if then somebody says, well, uh, this is the kind of person you are, or this is what you're saying, you say, uh uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not like that. So, um, and I think we even have an expression sometimes uh, we'll say uh, when, uh, when something is rejected by a journal, perhaps, which I've known, uh, or the IRS, uh, you say, the, the editor has spoken, um, or the, the IRS has spoken. In other words, they're just going they're, they're through their procedures, the referees uh, and so forth, um, uh, and doing what they always do, but it's pressing back on what you're trying to do to show that that's not the way. So I think there's a logic to it, um, although the way Terrence puts it is much more impressive, particularly when he talks about the Promethean uh, aspect of that. So anyway, yeah, you got me going on that. <laughs> boy, boy, that's tremendous. You know, one of my favorite um, um, quotes from all of Torrance's writings is in Theological Science. Um, and it's actually, I pulled it up here. It's page 122 on Theological Science. And let, let me go ahead and read it because I think it, it's Torrance saying what you're describing, that, that, that scientific knowing whether it's in theology or in the natural sciences, is an ongoing act of repentance. It's an act of ongoing repentance. Mm -hmm. But let me read his description. He, he just puts this so well. It's uh, uh, amazing to me. The, so, quote, the importance of scientific questioning is very obvious when we study the history of science, which in all its great stages of advance has entailed radical revision of its premises and methods. Advances mm -hmm. can be made only through new ways of looking at things, mm -hmm. through asking daring new questions. Mm -hmm. But new questions require corresponding changes in language and representation. They require changes in the framework of our concepts and in the logical structure of science yeah. itself. They may even call for a new meaning of the word understanding. But all that is part of the pain and awe and excitement of radically new knowledge. Yeah. The refusal yeah. to be bound by the rigid framework of our previous attainments, yeah. the capacity to wonder and be open for the radically new, the courage to adapt ourselves to the frighteningly novel are all involved in the forward leap of scientific research. But in the heart of it lies the readiness to revise the canons of our inquiry, to renounce cherished ideas, to change our mind, to be wide open to question, to repent. Isn't that an incredible paragraph? What page That's is that on? 122 of Theological yeah. Science, yeah. And it's so in tune uh, with actually the way the great scientists work. I, I, you must have noticed uh, any time uh, you read or hear a physicist talking about uh, the standard model, and they're saying, hey, the, the new experience and the standard model checks out entirely, but, we're kind of hoping it would break down because we we want to be able to know where to go forward, yeah. how to because we know it can't be the final truth. Right. So we don't want our theory to work all the time. We want it to, to, to some kind of experiment test that will sh show that it's not working. Right. Precisely so that we can uh, move ahead. And. Um, 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and I so like your analogy to personal relationships too. In the same way, if I really want to know someone, I'm going to focus on certain things about them that I wouldn't have expected, knowing that if I that those are the way forward to a deeper understanding of who they are. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't just want to rest content in my previous understanding of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So scientific, the natural order as a, a, uh, an impress on our minds is an echo in a way of what Torrance in the preface to theological science that you cite here is talking about how, how he knows God, that God has made, made it impossible for Torrance to deny God's existence and reality because of that impress upon his mind. And in a much uh, diminished way, an echo of it in a way, the natural order does that as well. And so knowing is a process of turning outward from ourselves, opening ourselves up to the objective reality beyond and accommodating ourselves to the reality rather than expecting reality to accommodate itself to us. So it appears at the top of page two, it appears at the top of page 250 that the word interrelatedness yeah. of objects, it that um, Torrance at the end of that paragraph. Um, connects it to invariances, and I wasn't, I couldn't quite figure out the connection between the word interrelatedness and invariances, but it seems important. Yes, um, well, that's the, the, the Torrance, I think, picks that up from relativity theory because, in spite of the fact that, as you all know, the relativity theory says it's supposed to say everything's relative, it's actually based on the idea that there are invariances, uh, speed of light being the. the primary one, but there's a whole series of those. Uh, every uh, uh, subject is based on the idea that there's symmetry and invariance. Um, so, but he's borrowing that and he's using that, I think, metaphorically. Um, so I, I was a little puzzled about that myself. Um, and um, Marty, I, I, yeah. I, I, so in this section, Chris, you've just raised the question, how does the impress of external reality upon our minds work in practice? And, right. and I think you're exactly right in, in saying, uh, you say the most promising clue that I've been able to find is Torrance's emphasis on, on mm -hmm. focusing not on objects in themselves, but on the relationships between objects as a mm -hmm. heuristic for mm -hmm. checking our own understanding and rooting mm -hmm. out our errors. Throughout, throughout his writings, he will often emphasize how, how important it is to go beyond a superficial grasp of something based on just the external appearances of things. Mm -hmm. And if we want to reach beyond the external appearances, we're looking, we're trying to discern internal relations. Mm -hmm. That means relations that are part of the essences of things, because we don't think of something as a thing in itself, but rather as a thing in relation. Mm -hmm. And so that's only disclosed in the patterns of relations that we can discern. And when those patterns turn up from different vantage points, then in a way that's the analogy with relativity and light being invariant. So when we can see enduring patterns, uh, that we're on much stronger footing than if our focus is on things isolated, objects in isolation. Yeah, I think that, that, that his uh, uh, interest in field theory probably is in the back of his mind there also. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. I, I think he gets yeah. that uh, a lot. Yeah. He's expressing that a lot in, in Maxwell's uh, terminology. And right. Right. Uh, Duane mentions that uh, John McKenna was working on the logos as that scientific ordering person moving beyond a principle. and. Uh, McKenna and McGrath used the word interface. Thank you, Dwayne. I attempt to tra translate these into what I call the science of the personal. So field theory in, in understanding what it means to be persons beginning with the field of the Trinity and then what it means to be created as persons within that mm -hmm. opens up all those kinds of things too. But there are invariances, I think, if I understand it. Love and fear would be invariances 
and perfect love casts out fear as the invariance of God's love casts out that which is susceptible. When love does its work, fear goes away within the field of the personal. So anyway, I'm just looking for the translatability of how the, it explores the internal structures of our human existence based out of God's way of being invariantly. Marty, that sounds like a cool example of exaptation. <laughs> of yes, I do a lot of that. Thing. Yeah, that's that's right. Okay, so I think we've pretty much hit on <laughs> the topics in the next section. Uh, scientific discovery as a form of revelation, mm -hmm, pages yes. 250 and 251. Um, uh, uh, where where Torrance is going beyond Einstein at this point, again reiterated um, because of oh, I, almost I, I, revelatory I'm, character. I'm sorry, go ahead. 251, uh, just, to, uh, just to kind of as a segue here. Um, well, after going through some of that reasoning, I say it's a fifth line down from the top of 251, just below footnote 68. In that respect, scientific discovery is indeed very much like divine re revelation. The human mind seems to be pre-adapted for both. Yeah. Why does it so remains to be seen? Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. And then you get into a section which is a little bit of a digression, uh, but uh, uh, about the role of light. And the main reason I included it is because Torrance talked about it and I, I wanted to do justice to that. Uh, yeah. Um, so you're bringing in the image of God and, yes. and a unique human ability to understand the works of God. Um, and you bring in the two books metaphor that Na the natural order is itself also a book written by the finger of God, and um, and and in his response to this um, to your chapter, Torrance did emphasize uh, how reading the two books together enlarges the human capacity to read either one. In a way that the human mind is engaged by information beyond itself in in either book that we're reading. Mm -hmm. Um, Do we say there's a sequence of reading the book of scripture, i.e. by Calvin, and then the book of nature, that there's, if you go the other way, then you end up with natural theology. Is that a fair assessment? As long as it's not too simplistically defined, because, because the imprint, impress of the natural order on our minds is part of how we read scripture. Um, think of all of Jesus' parables uh, referring to the natural order, and it would be impossible to even read scripture if we weren't already open to the natural order that has come from the same same author, mm -hmm. the same logos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the non-duality that, that I think Torrance would... Uh... So, I, yes, uh, the way I would answer... That Marty's a little like Jesus' answer to uh, I think it was one of the scribes saying, "You are not far from the kingdom of God." <laughs> so, and, and I'm sure I've, I've heard Torrance say something like that to to uh, people who are coming from the scientistic uh, side. Is that yeah, you, you're you've got a good start there, uh, yeah. and I think uh, that's a very important thing for Christians to tr to realize and to communicate is that. Faith doesn't require um, shutting science down or limiting it. it. It's more a question of following through on inquiry <clears throat> because there are lots of openings that can lead into theological questions uh, and theological discourse. Um, and um, so, which is then at least the, the, the beginning of a, a wondering about uh, where the answers might be. Yeah. I, I use the distinction between personalism and personalistic as the same as pr scientism and scientific, yes. that one of them comes in with a pre-adjudicated set of assumptions and then reads things through that, whereas scientific mm -hmm. has this openness, the yeah. heuristic yeah. discovery process. And so personalism um, often is reading off of the nature of the human person, in a sense, with a set of assumptions that have not been appropriately critiqued. So to say personalistic 
for Torrance is to recognize that the creator of the universe who comes in the person of Christ does give us much of the dialogical nature of the interrelationship of studying what it means to be physical beings with emotions and will and thought and all that so that we don't choose between them in a sense, but there is a stereophonic kind of way of engaging. So I think that's kind of what I hear you saying is that there is a wisdom that is gained with both. Yes. But one must always be critiquing one's assumptions in the process on either side. Yeah. That's Particularly when you, when you uh, uh, think of the, the creed, which is in three articles, the first of which being creator of heaven and earth. Yes. It's only when you've got that that you then go on to, uh, well, Athanasius, uh, Contragentes uh, de Incarnationa, you begin with creation uh, and uh, understanding that. The church fathers did that. And um, that's a, and, and it was regarded as necessary for, for biblical exegesis. Uh, in Augustine, who's uh, a Christian uh, teaching, you, you need to know these things in order to understand yeah. the scriptures. I'm working in Mark's 3D1 right now. And he, he said, you know, it begins with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We have to understand the God who is the maker first to really have a, an understanding that God made all this and all the, everything you've been saying about orderliness and the invariances then would be the articulation of the nature of the way that is played out even in the first days of, of Genesis 1 account, that it's implicit, the invariance and the interrelatedness is all there, each unfolded one step at a time. Great. I appreciated uh, both your comments, Marty, and, and yours, Chris. Very, very fascinating. Um, that timer everyone heard go off is the signal that we need to draw to a close. Um, but in this section on the bottom of page 252, we can really see where, Chris, you've gotten to the place where you're raising your your question, uh, uh, your, your question for Torrance uh, and how his thinking could be extended quite explicitly. So you're, you've given, you're giving two examples of analogies between the book of theology and the book of science in a way and asking if there's agreement between the reference. So the first one is divine light and created light in theology and the referent is the creation of light in scientific cosmology, whether the Big Bang or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so then you're posing, okay, Torrance is on board with that, but, but mm -hmm. he didn't address the, the question of, is there a referent or what is the referent between the theological statement of humanity mm -hmm. created in the image of God exactly. yeah. and translating that into the What's the corollary in evolutionary biology for the pre-adaptation of the human mind? So you're raising that question for him yeah. here on page 252 and over to 253. Three, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, and that leads right into the mobility of angels um, uh, question where you're now beginning to explore that question and wondering how Torrance would respond. And so on page... 253 to be to begin this the second paragraph you say at some point in the discussion we must ask what might have happened in prehistory that could have pre-adapted the pre-adapted the human intellect to understand the deep structures of creation and then you begin to explore um, what that might look like um, for example on the middle of page 255 you 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 query, could it be that the environmental forces that stimulated the development of spiritual gifts among early humans uh, have actually pre-adapted their or our minds to meeting the challenges of disciplines like mathematics and cosmology? So these are just really interesting questions on the intersection mm -hmm. of theology mm -hmm. and science. and. Uh, I, I think it's it's wonderful how you're sh you're demonstrating by raising these que this question uh, the continuing relevance of Torrance's work for questions and domains that he didn't have time or inclination to in engage in himself and um, 
would, would you like to comment on either of these sections? Uh, I, I think that's a good place to leave it. Uh, I would just say that uh, at the time, uh, departing from the paper now, just to say when I was writing this um, in the late 1990s, I talked to Professor Torrance. I, uh, I think I actually presented it to him and he gave his response in, I think it was January of the year 2000. I, anyway, mm -hmm. I was um, doing some reading uh, about um, Paleolithic spirituality. Uh, and uh, that kind of seemed to me to be the, the way to go forward because it is actually a, a matter of uh, anthropology with evidence, but the evidence has to be interpreted and not all people agree about the interpretation, but I'd read a, a book by Jean Clot and uh, David Lewis Williams, a South African, French and South African anthropologists. And, and the way they describe <clears throat> the um, cave paintings, particularly in France and Northern Spain, uh, and the role that they played in contacting the spirit world, uh, the heavenly world, uh, the world of ideas, if you played, uh, it sounds very much like the kind of thing uh, that would be involved. And so if there was an adaptation of some sort, as seems likely because this kind of behavior is found in, in uh, peoples all around the world, uh, until the modern age anyway. Um, so anyway, I, I was working on that and I wrote that up in the um, second chapter of the Theology of Scientific Endeavor, uh, which has the advantage of having each chapter has a little uh, abstract at the beginning so people could just even look at the abstract and get the idea. But we don't need to go into that today. That's, that's going a little too far uh, beyond this topic. All right, wonderful. Yeah, maybe, maybe I could um, uh, offer this in closing, uh, point to page 334 in Torrance's response where Torrance, just in summary of his response to the chapter says, quote, Professor Kaiser rightly stresses here the point I make that there is no logical bridge between ideas and reality, and therefore no logical bridge between data and the concepts on which a good theory rests, no logical road to the discovery of the laws of nature. That is why the scientist in formulating them must rely on what Einstein referred to as intuition. That is an intuition arising under the constraint or impress of the rationality of the created order upon the scientist's mind. And um, yeah. you know, for humanity in an intelligible cosmos, uh, uh, the, the title of this chapter uh, it's just a tremendous starting point, I think, to see not only what Torrance thought in, in a central case, the case of Albert Einstein, but also its potential ramifications and, and extensibility and adaptability to other domains as diverse as evolutionary biology and anthropology and uh, history of art, uh, et cetera. Yes, so, exactly. So, uh, Tremendous chapter, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us to discuss well, it. You. Maybe we could impose on you for just a couple minutes if there are there, there are sure. further questions from, sure. from the group. Uh, we could take take just a couple minutes. Or comments. The question that comes up for some people, um, once you once you talk about intelligibility, the design. You know, intelligent design. To what degree um, does what you have put in this chapter incline somebody towards an intelligent design kind of argument that isn't the same as intuition necessarily? Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of speak to that? Um, yes. Uh, well, what I'm talking about here is not the same as the capital. In I intelligent capital D design uh, program, which is more about a divine intervention or maybe uh, uh, tipping things this way or that uh, by the divine. Um, but in a way, it's another way of getting at uh, what they want. Uh, so 
one of the uh, founders of that movement, whose name I'm not coming up with right away, said that the objective they had, they wanted to see the fingerprints of God in the created order. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a legitimate uh, question, uh, particularly from a Trinitarian point of view, where you uh, think of the vestigia uh, trinitatis, the, uh, the, the imprints or footprints or fingerprints of the, uh, of the divine. And it seems to me that this so-called pre-established harmony uh, is, a, is a very good example of that. Uh, there may be some others as well. Um, well, just the, the, uh, the role of the logos in uh, the order of creation is one. Uh, and what's interested me recently is um, that I picked up on uh, an idea that John Archibald Wheeler articulated, and then Stephen Hawking picked up on it, the, the, uh, the idea at the end of Hawking's book, The Brief History of Time, that uh, we could perhaps discover the final theory, uh, but it would just be uh, an equation. And the question is, what actually makes that equation get up and do something? What, what, I think he said, what's oh, the fire yeah. in the equation? Uh, did, did you see my invite there so we could just chat on Google? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yes, that's the right. The other question yeah. is just looking ahead, is there anything that you wish students would carry on for what you got from Torrance and what you take? Is there anything that you wish that there would be students who would carry on beyond what you did? Well, yes, uh, I'm not satisfied with anything I did. And, uh, but when I read uh, Torrance's Space, Time and Incarnation, uh, it was toward the end of the book, he threw out some ideas. I think one had to do with Gödel and another one had to do with El Sasser, and there were a couple of different things. And, um, and then I thought, boy, if I could just take one of those and work it out more, uh, with more uh, detail and more uh, thought through, it would, that would be worthwhile. So maybe someone would simply pick up on on, uh, on one idea or, or a phrase uh, that I've used. But the, I just would like to leave one other thing. Um, when I first heard Torrance lecture, and I think this was in what's posted on your website, it was at Yale uh, Divinity School in. Uh, early 1971. Um, the thing I remember most is his different distinction between quaestio and interrogatio. He's going back to the Middle Ages. And quaestio was, there, well, there are these questions that everybody has to deal with, and there's this, this, this answer and that answer and another answer, and there's this in favor and that in favor and so forth. And this is kind of re basically rehashing what's already there, but maybe you know, to, uh, coming to one conclusion or another. Whereas interrogatio is questioning more deeply, as he sometimes said, questioning even the question. In fact, uh, Carrie was referring to this idea a few minutes ago uh, <laughs> in the introduction to uh, theological science. Um, to, to actually try to go beyond the concepts and even the way we approach things, um, to be, particularly when they're not working uh, or they're not working adequately. And maybe that's the best thing, is to not be afraid to step out and try to come up with a way of looking at things. Niels Bohr uh, had a student who came to him one time rather sheepishly with uh, some thing scribbled on a piece of paper and he asked Bohr what he thought. Bohr looked at it. The student said, it's, well, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Bohr said, yes, but is it crazy enough to be true? <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta have that kind of willingness to, to, to uh, uh, rethink. And I think that's really what Torrance was doing all along. Oh, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. I appreciate it too. Thank you.